Okay, uh, welcome everybody who is uh, watching this uh, live stream. Uh, my name is Peter Jang. I am the Chicago Lead Instructor and the uh, Actualized Deed of Instruction. Um, and uh, what you guys are going to be seeing today are the presentations from the most recent group of Chicago graduates. Um, wow, okay. Sorry about that pause there. I actually had the live stream running uh, simultaneously with my uh, with me talking. And so I just heard myself uh, a three second delay. Um, as much as I like hearing myself speak, I probably should turn that off. Um, okay, so yeah, um, I'm really proud to introduce uh, the uh, presentations for this uh, group of students. Um, uh, there's uh, 18 students in this cohort. Uh, we're going to be doing nine students at a time. So in this two hour block, it will be Scott, Tony, Eden, Dan, Tripp, Nate, Neil, Liam, and Dan. We have two Dans um, in this cohort. Um, and then in the second two hour block, it's going to be Ethan, Travell, Deanna, Paul, Yesenia, Stephen, Tom, Ernesto, and Ryan. So if anybody's watching the live stream and they're looking um, to see the, a particular student, um, just be aware that there's gonna be two different sections for that. Um, yeah, so uh, these groups of students actually started uh, the Chicago cohort in person and then, uh, you know, COVID-19, the quarantine hits, so we actually transitioned to an online format. Um, so everybody here, uh, I just want to say, you know, up front did an amazing job with that transition um, and really sort of uh, shouldered all of the, the difficulties of just the quarantine and all of the difficulties that people were facing while taking a class, while working their jobs um, and their capstone presentations and their projects. Um, I just think that everybody really pulled together and did an amazing job overall. Um, so I'm really uh, looking forward to, to seeing all of these presentations. Um, before we get started, uh, I would also like to introduce our panelists. We have three panelists today. Um, so let's go ahead and introduce uh, Karen, if you can say a few words about yourself really briefly. Hey, you're doing that thing to me that that person did to you. I was not prepared. <laughs> <laughs> um, I attended Actualize when it was still known as Anyone Can Learn to Code. So that was in 2016. I am currently a software engineer at Coyote Logistics. We are a UPS owned company. Um, I work on React Native, and before that, I actually did .NET. So I'm a great example of how you can take your Ruby knowledge and what you know about coding in general and just apply to any technology uh, job that you want to. Um, Actualize was life-changing for me, and I'm really, really happy to be a part of the Actualize family, and I'm really excited to see your project. Awesome. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, our second panelist is Miles Warner. If you can say a few words about yourself, Miles. Yeah, Karen just crushed that and I wasn't prepared for this. So <laughs> what do I say now? Um, I graduated Actualize when it was Actualize. I think it was maybe one or two cohorts after the name change uh, in January 2017. Um, I worked at Healthcare Services Corporation, also known as Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois, um, for two and a half years after that. And I started working at Hyatt Hotels in December. Um, little poor timing, working for a hotel company in light of the, uh, the situation we find ourselves in now. But um, I am surviving there. And it's, it's a great, uh, great team that I work on. Um, Kind of like Karen, I've worked both front end and back end products before. I've done stuff in React, not React Native, but um, browser React. Um, and most of my time has been spent as a back end API designer. So a lot of stuff in Kotlin, Java, um, and really working in in sort of the the digital transformation space. So um, had the pleasure of working for portfolios within companies that were sort of on the cutting edge of, of transforming the way software is developed within those companies. So big focus on agile practices, test driven development, pair programming, CICD, um, all those good buzzwords, buzzwords, so. Awesome, thanks so much, Miles. And then last, but certainly not least, um, we have the CEO of Actualize, Jay Wengro, who is also a panelist. Jay, if you wanna say a few words. Yeah, well, firstly, I wanna say congratulations to everyone here, all the graduates, um, I think, I guess I'm echoing Peter's sentiment, but the only thing harder than attending a coding bootcamp is attending a coding bootcamp during a pandemic. So congrats to all of you for doing that, especially with the transition. 
Um, I know firsthand of how all the students put in so much work into the capstones and uh, really congrats to all of you. And I'm really excited to see them. Also, I'm gonna take the time to thank Peter, our Dean and Lead Instructor of this cohort for uh, making these cohorts uh, so amazing and uh, especially kudos to him in this particular instance of the transition from the Chicago to the online format. Um, wanna thank the TAs as well. And also Lisa, our amazing career advisor. And thank you to the panelists as well. And that's it. All right, awesome. So with that, um, we can go ahead and get started. Um, the first presenter is going to be Scott, followed by uh, Jay as the first panelist. So Scott, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself and share your screen and we can, we can begin. All right, great. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Peter. Uh, my name is Scott Garriel. I am very excited to be kicking off the Capstones this evening. Um, for my Capstone, I got my inspiration through my love of cooking and my passion for cooking. Um, I absolutely love being able to make something in the kitchen and be able to share it with family and friends, something I've always enjoyed doing. Um, something that's been pretty difficult in the past or in the past few months, just with everything happening right now. Um, a lot of people are trying to limit trips to the grocery store reduce food waste. Um, and it's, it is, it's posing to be kind of an issue. And I, I figured I wanted to see if there's a way I can solve that problem. So here I have my capstone, which is called pantry poles. Um, the idea of the name being that you have the ability to pull ingredients out of your pantry, out of your refrigerator and be able to create a recipe with that. So why don't we go ahead and show you how it works. Um, new users have the ability to log in but I'm gonna go ahead and log in with my information. All right, and upon logging in, uh, you're brought to the homepage. Uh, so what is Pantry Polls? Like I mentioned before, um, we're the first ever dynamic recipe search app. Um, our mission is we're dedicated to helping you limit trips to the grocery store, uh, reduce food waste and learn something new along the way. Um, something I think a lot of people are trying to do in their free time at home right now. Or you have a confused cook in her kitchen, not sure what to make. So uh, why don't we solve that? I think the really cool thing about this app that I love is how user-friendly it is, the flow of it all. So here's a button, uh, check out your pantry. You can go click on it, as well as there's a option at the top in the nav bar. So this takes you right to your unique pantry. So all these ingredients are things that I currently have in my home right now, in my refrigerator, in my pantry, that I can go ahead and start cooking with right now. Um, as you see, there's a, a search bar at the bottom. I'll come back to that. Um, but what I love most about this is I can wake up in the morning when I'm getting ready for the day, you know, in my bedroom still. I can pull this op open this app and able to see what I have in my pantry and what I can make that day, what I want to cook for breakfast. So you can kind of prepare and get a head start. So if you click on the let's start cooking button, um, this brings you right to a recipes page. This is kind of like a Recipes index, um, a lot of different recipes uploaded by yourself and other chefs, people sharing things they've made in the past that they've really liked. Uh, here you have a picture of avocado toast, some banana bread, uh, pesto ravioli. I mean, that sounds amazing. So there's a little uh, description of what it is along with the person who uploaded it, famous chef Mario Batali. Um, and also all the ingredients needed to make that recipe. You can also click and view more information about that recipe, such as the directions, uh, the prep time, as well as notes. So here we have different notes that the chef chose to share tips and tricks that they've learned with it. Um, what's great is I have a nut allergy. I really can't have pesto. I wish I could. I know a lot of people think it's delicious. So I don't wanna see this recipe anymore. I have the ability to go ahead and delete that recipe and it will no longer show up in my recipes page. So next time I'm logged in, um, I won't even be bothered by having the option of having pesto. But uh, the, I think the most fun thing about cooking is being able to make a recipe and share it with other people. Uh, say you made something delicious for lunch that day, you really liked and you want other people to try it. You can go ahead and create a new recipe right here, which will then, I'll just show you real quick, populate it in the recipes page right at the bottom here. 
which is cool. So a lot other people can log in, they can see your recipe and they can, you know, wow, that sounds delicious. I'm gonna go ahead and try that as well. So what really sets us apart is if I go back to the pantry, here's all the ingredients that I have that I can cook with right now. Um, I have a recipe search bar at the bottom. If I wanted to make something with pesto or ricotta or bananas, I can go ahead and search for that recipe. Uh, say I wanna make something with bananas and we'll make it with some eggs. And uh, let's see what else. Yeah, banana and eggs, we'll see what that makes. So I can go ahead and search. And what this actually is doing is it's searching the internet and pulling back a bunch of different recipes that are found on the internet containing those ingredients. So here we have banana. Um, this is a chocolate banana French toast, all the ingredients listed below. You also have the calorie count as well as the diet and allergy information. And what's really cool about this that I love is this name right here is an actually dynamic link that you can click on and it will take you to the external website where this recipe actually lives. I'll have more information about the recipe and you can kind of find more things. So it's a fun way to, fun way to be able to cook. Now you might be seeing, uh, maybe I don't have a lot of these things, maple syrup, vanilla extract. Um, what's great about this app is I can go to my ingredients page and say I went to the grocery store and I picked up something I needed. I can go ahead and add that to my pantry right here and it will pop up right at the bottom. Now I know a lot of recipes have information that you might not have at home, uh, different recipes, different ingredients. So for version 2.0, um, we are actually working on a shopping cart where you can actually add the ingredient to your shopping cart and be able, uh, it will be linked up with a service such as Instacart well, they'll actually do the shopping for you and home delivery. So it'll be a true way of contactless cooking, which I think is something will be very important for the future um, that a lot of people will be conscious of given the current situation right now in the world. And that's it, that's Pantry Pulse. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you so much, Scott. Um, so uh, let's open it up to the first panelist, which is Jay Wengro. Hey, Scott, congratulations. This is a really amazing app. What would you say is the feature that you're most proud of? Because there's lots of features here. And sometimes, you know, the more complex ones, once you pull through, there's like that state of like ecstasy, like, well, I did it. So which of these features would you say is the one you're most proud of? Yeah, thank you, Jay. Um, I really like the pantry page. I think the idea for me was it is a situation everyone's going through right now. I mean, cooking three meals a day at home is difficult, not to mention all the dishes you're creating. Like, it's easy to get discouraged, but um, I really like the feature that you can go ahead and click on something and it will auto populate in the recipe search bar. But you could also search the internet. I only have three recipes that are feeding back to me now, but you can bump it out to as many as you want and uh, be able to see what you can really create with the recipe you have and um, be able to try something new, which I think is the really fun part of it. Yeah. Can you tell me more about how you're pulling those recipes from the internet? Is that an API that you're talking about? Yeah. So I found an API on the internet and linked it up um, and have it just searching the internet for the query parameter that I'm putting in for the ingredient. Got it. What's, do you know the name of that API? Uh, I do. Yeah, I believe it's it's kind of a weird name. It's Adam, Adam Mom or something strange like that. It's like a play on Adam Mame, but not the full word. Got it. Got it. And yeah. it pulls, I saw how it, when you clicked on the recipe, it brought you, I think maybe it was a BBC or something like that. Is that, yeah. is that API pulling from like all different sources then? Yeah, so it's pulling from uh, all these different websites. Martha Stewart was a page that came up once, yeah. um, BBC. So whoever, where the recipe actually lives, um, it'll pull from that site. Got it, got it. This is really cool uh, and really impressive, Scott. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you very much. All right, thank you again, Scott and Jay. Um, our next presenter will be Tony. So Tony, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, share your screen. Hey, how's it going guys? Uh, my name is Tony. Uh, oh, I've been buying and collecting sneakers for uh, about six, seven years now. And I decided to build an app where uh, you can go in, buy shoes, uh, sell them, but also have the ability to trade them as well. Uh, so let me just go ahead and log in really quick. Okay, so I'm logged in. 
this. Okay, so I can view different products for different users. So I can click on the users uh, page. I can view their inventory. Uh, I also installed an API called Mapbox, so I can view their location. I, and I also added another feature for me to be able to reach out to a seller, uh, you know, ask them if they're willing to trade a particular shoe. So I added a beautiful chat, uh, that's what it's called. And, you know, I can send them a message, uh, ask them if they're, you know, open for a trade. Uh, I can reply. Uh, I also installed a an image recognition API. So what I was trying to accomplish was to be able to take a picture of a shoe and get the information about that particular shoe, like the name. So let's say you see someone, you know, walking down the street and you know you like their pair of shoes, but you don't know the name. And you don't want to spend an hour going through, you know, Foot Locker or Nike or whatever. Uh, so I use Google Cloud's uh, Vision API. Uh, it's running kind of slow right now, but this is something that I'm working for version two. Uh, it's not working properly right now, but I can see like the description. So it's telling me that it's a shoe, uh, it's a sneaker. It's telling me the color. So that's something that I got to work. Uh, for version two, obviously. And I want to get the cart working as well. So that's something that I'm saving for version two as well. Uh, but yeah, that's that's my app, you know, it's pretty simple, nothing too crazy, I guess. All right, Tony, that's uh, did an awesome job. Um, so let's open it up to the uh, panelists, which will be Miles. Yeah, great work, Tony. I totally Thanks, apologize. My my connection got a little unstable there in the middle. So um, if you addressed anything, any questions I ask, uh, that, that's my bad. I'm, I'm at my parents' house right now and, and their, their internet speeds are mildly questionable. So um, yeah, so I'm, I'm curious, kind of going off what, what Jay asked before, but what, what did you find is um, both the most rewarding and difficult features or aspects of, of building this? Uh, difficult feature, I want to say working with the APIs, uh, especially with the Google Cloud. Uh, I'm still, I, uh, I want to be able to like see more information about, you know, or get it to work properly, I guess I should say. Uh, most rewarding part, uh, I guess will be the same, uh, working with APIs, because, you know, I got to see like different aspects. Uh, I had to read a lot of information, watch videos on YouTube. I also got a lot of help from, you know, my instructor. So that was great. Uh, but. Cool. And and then as far as tech stacks go, what what am I looking at here on the front end versus? Uh, like the chat box. Uh, sorry. Uh, I think Miles got cut off a little bit. Yeah. Um, so his question was, uh, what is he looking at in terms of like back end and front end? What uh, frameworks or, or libraries did you use? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, so I use uh, Ruby and Rails in the back end and uh, Vue.js in the front end and along with the API. So. Cool. Um, yeah, this is, this is really awesome work. I, uh, I'm, I'm I'm into this. I think I think this is going to look really cool with um, with that messaging app feature, um, like this idea, and and then the image recognition obviously will make this uh, make this pretty awesome. So it could work. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Tony and Miles. Um, next presenter is going to be Eden, and the next panelist will be Karen. So Eden, if you can unmute and share your screen. Okay. 
Hello, my name is Eden Bakella, um, and this is my application. It's an artisan events app. Um, I haven't come up with a cool name for the app yet, um, so I just have artists and events in events. Um, so um, I wanted to create this application as a resource center for uh, um, women of color. This is something that's really important to me. Um, I love going to events and shows, um, or at least I used to. Um, and it's, um, I feel as though sometimes they can become um, kind of male dominated spaces. Um, so I really wanted to create kind of a platform for women of color to kind of connect and to find different artists, um, whether they are well-established artists or someone who just wants to kind of share their creativity. So I wanted to keep it pretty broad. Um, so first off, uh, I'm gonna take you to the categories page. I wanted to keep the categories also pretty broad where you could um, basically leave it up for interpretation. So that I feel like art is a very open thing. Um, so we have food, whether that's cooking, baking, grilling. Um, we have decorative arts that could be um, jewelry, clothing. Uh, we have painting, words, whether that's uh, poetry, spoken word, and music. Um, so then we can click into one of our categories and view all of the different artists that are in the category. Um, so as you see, we have two artists in the words category and you can view more info um, and go back to all categories. We won't view more info right now, but we can go back to all categories. Um, okay, and then um, we can sign up into the application. Um, I already have a user, so I'm gonna click on log in and sign in. Okay, and then it takes you back to the home page once you're signed in, um, and you can go to artists. And you can see all of the different artists that are on the app. And then we can view one of the artists and go to more info. Um, and then you can see all of the different images that the artist submitted. Um, as well as if they submitted an image of themselves. You can see the artist's bio as well as a description of their work. Um, and then you can also favorite an artist um, by clicking on this button here. You can view all favorited artists by going to this favorite artist um, button in the nav bar. And as you can see, Eden's favorited artists are here and you can see that Poison Honey is now one of my favorited artists. Um, okay, and then I'm going to take you back to the artist. Um, if you scroll down, so any artist um, like this one um, who submits music, you're able to go in here. Um, so she submitted poetry as well as music. So you can see her poetry as well as um, an image of her that she submitted. And then you can also listen to any music that they have um, here. And there's a song title. Um, and this MP3 player will show up only for artists that are musicians and have submitted MP3. Um, and I'm going to favorite this artist so that we can just see kind of live action, the favorite button. And as you see, Daniela is one of our favorited artists now. Um, and then I can take you to the event. Um, and we have a calendar here and I use the calendar for this calendar. And you can see that on the 13th, we have an open mic coming up and we have an art show on the 25th. Um, so we look through the different events. And then um, here is an art show and here's the open mic. So I have two events at the moment. Um, and then you can click on more info to view more info about each event, um, the date, the location, and the description. Um, and then go back to all events. And you can also go down to the bottom and you can look at this map of the different events. And a marker should appear the event as well as the location of the event for each one. Um, yeah, and I think the only part I didn't show is the about page, which is just um, kind of a description of what I said at the beginning. Um, 
So yeah, and then um, for version two of the app, one of the things that I really wanna add is um, a create feature for the artists so that um, users are able to submit new artists and different events featuring women of color artists to the application. Um, this would have to be administrator approved and then it would be added into the site. Um, something I'd also like to do is um, to make it more interactive so that um, artists are, can, be, ha can have some administrator privileges and are able to kind of update and change their own information as well as have some type of a platform so that um, they can actually communicate with one another um, via like messaging. And um, one of the things I haven't added yet to is um, all of the social media for each of the artists so that you can uh, connect to them directly through their social media. And um, lastly, like I guess this would kind of be version three. Um, I have been kind of tinkering around with uh, view native. Um, I haven't gotten very far at all, but like the only thing that I've gotten is like the name of the app and oh, sorry, the name of the app as well as like an animation um, that I've just been like playing around with. But um, yeah, I think it would be really cool to make an iOS app through view native. So yes, that is my artist and events application. All right, awesome job, Eden. Um, let's open it up to our panelist, Karen. Eden, I am so excited that I get to be your panelist. <laughs> your project is probably one of the more fleshed out projects I've ever seen. So awesome job. This is really cool. And I have so many questions, we don't have enough time. So I was like having a hard time like narrowing down my questions. Um, first of all, are those artists that you featured on there actual artists? Yeah, so I actually, some of them were dummy data artists, um, and some of them, I think four of them are real artists that I know and I'm uh, friends with, and I asked to submit their artwork. So like, this is one of my good friends that she submitted some poetry. Um, this is one of my friends who submitted her artwork. Um, this is dummy data. The name is a real person for some of them, but like, it's dummy data. Um, and then the, music, the musician is real, and then, this person is real. This is a oh, well, that's, friend of mine. that's super cool that you're actually like able to promote your friend's art yeah. with you know your project. That's amazing. So then do you plan? I know you said you have a version three now and you're playing with it, which is awesome. I can tell you're going to be super successful. Like just the fact that you want to just tinker with it on your own time is it tells me you're going to go really far. Um, but do you do you actually plan on like making this live and publishing it and everything? Yeah, I think it would be really cool to be able to make this live. I definitely would want to kind of flesh it out more. And like, um, there are like a few things like um, with like the CSS, I kind of want to um, like there's, it's not big things, but like I would like this, for example, like when I click on it for it to be highlighted or like kind of mess with some of the CSS so that it um, is a little bit more streamlined or fluid and like um, just like looks a little bit better. but. Um, yeah, I would love to be able to eventually launch this and get a domain and um, put it out there. Yeah, that would be super cool. I saw you have so many features that honestly take so much time, like a map feature and, and the MP3 player. How did you get that to work? Yeah, so for the MP3 player, let me see if I can get there quickly. Um, the MP3 player, so basically I just had to do a V4 loop through um, all of the different artists. Um, and then I just had to say basically like if um, uh, I created another table that's like a music table and then um, if an artist has music, um, then it shows up and if not, then they don't, it doesn't show up for them. What's the name of the technology? Um, so the MP3 player is View Audio Better. Um, so I used that, it's like a View MP3 player that I used um, for it. And um, yeah, to loop it through, I just did like a V4 loop. And I can actually, if you want, I can show you my code for it. Um, yeah, if we have time, Peter, then that would be awesome. Yeah. You have a so, short amount of time, but yeah, we can take, definitely take a look. Yeah, I don't think yeah. I've ever seen anyone incorporate music in their project as far as I've seen. So this is really fascinating. Yeah, so this is it right here. Um, it's a mini audio player that I use. And then I put an MP3 with a song file in there. 
Um, and I just put it in like the image file, but um, yeah. And then I did a V4 for song and artist that song. And then I just had um, an artist songs in my uh, JSON file, my artist uh, JSON file. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nice job. All righty. Yeah. Thank you so much, Thank Eden you. and Karen. Um, okay, so uh, let's go ahead and do our next presenter. I think, Dan, I originally said you were next, but I'm going to swap the order real quick to give you uh, some time to set up over there. Um, so we're going to go with uh, Trip, and the next panelist, I believe, is going to be Jay. So Trip, if you can go ahead and share your screen. Well, hello, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Um, so I actually switched my ideas right in the middle of... Uh, I started off with a certain idea and then I switched to one that was a little more passionate about. Um, I've always been a really big Star Wars fan. Uh, it was actually pretty funny because Peter's first, uh, Peter's question yesterday was, was the first movie you've ever been to? And my first movie, actually, my uncle took me to see Empire Strikes Back when I was about four or five years old. So that was like the first theater I've ever experienced. I've always been a huge, huge Star Wars fan. Um, so I kind of just wanted to build a, uh, a fan site because, you know, most of the ones out there just aren't that great. Um, so, my site is called Yoda and starts off with the opening crawl here. Um, just sort of was able to incorporate this in and add whatever text that I wanted. Um, I will tell you, I, I really went more front end on this, on this application because that's just something I wanted to learn more about. Um, but it'll go through the scroll here for you. And then once you get to the end, you'll be able to go into the website. Just let it finish off here. Uh, so once we enter, we hit our landing page. Uh, we got a, some cool stuff here. Uh, I, I found the CSS down here to where you can uh, scroll down and move the VB8 around. So that's just a cool little function I got in there. Um, pretty much the basis idea for this was to be able to show off your cool Star Wars stuff. Um, so I just kind of got everyone was able to sign in and make your own product and show off whatever you want. Uh, you'll be able to get more details here. We got approximate value of the item. Uh, I know these things are ridiculously expensive. Um, a link to buy it and then just back to all products so we can look through whatever we want. And I just got a bunch of dummy data in here to kind of make it look cool. Um, next. Go back to home. I include this button here because it's a little tough getting around with this uh, button up here. So the home will take you back to the landing page and kind of go wherever you want with it. Uh, you go to sign in, show off your own uh, collectible, whatever you want. Pick category accordingly. Um, so that was, I, I kind of went from there and then I, I got into the Swappy API, which is a Star Wars API with a lot of information. Um, so I kind of just made a sort of basic table here with uh, it's got characters, planets, films, uh, species, vehicles, starships, uh, just a whole bunch of information. And then if you click more details on the person, it'll give you all their information about uh, what it is, what it is, you know, uh, their year, eye color. So the I don't know why Luke doesn't have a species here. I think maybe just because everyone knows he's human already. Uh, but yeah, it's a cool little API. I got a lot of uh, useless Star Wars information on it, pretty much. Um, so from there, uh, I found a couple cool, really cool code pens, which are just kind of little websites. So we got Polygons of the Universe here, which kind of just shows you polygons of all the uh, different. Let's see if we can refresh that there. So I'll just change into a different. And you pretty much you got all the movies here. We got one. So each one will take you to a different group of uh, people, which I thought was pretty cool. Not sure why that happened. Um, but yeah, I thought that was a little cool little code pad. That was very difficult because you had to make five different pages for the five different uh, polygons. Um, another cool little code pen here, find out your Star Wars name. 
Uh, Peter, you want to let's do you, man? What's your mother's maiden name? Are you trying to steal my uh, like uh, personal info? Are you trying to hack I, me there? I want to show you your Star Wars name is all. All right, my mother's maiden name is Ham. H A M. And birth city. My birth city is uh, Chicago. So you just type in the information. So your Star Wars name is John P. Hock. Hockey. That sounds vaguely Asian, so it must be yeah. true. The Star Wars name, you know, exactly. Um, so that's just a cool little addition to the page there. Uh, I got movie links here. So pretty much all these movies go straight to a website where you can actually watch the movie. Um, I don't have it hooked up legally, obviously, but you can watch the movies here. Just takes a second to start usually because of the drive player. But yeah, thought that was a cool little feature to add in just so people could be able to watch the movies if they wanted to come to the site. Um, and then, yeah, you know, you can sign up for an account here. Uh, you can log in, obviously. We'll do a little, let's do, Let's email. Gotcha. Just to the login. Yeah. So it's just a cool little you know Star Wars site. Uh, I had a lot more that I wanted to do. I just didn't get to it. Obviously, uh, it is a lot of work working with CSS, and that is one thing that I definitely did a lot with. Um, but yeah, that's about it. Awesome. Great job. Great job, Trip. Um, let's open it up to uh, panelists for questions. Jay? Yeah, this is fantastic, Trip. <clears throat> My kids right now are going through their Star Wars phase, doing all the Star Wars coloring books right now. Yeah, getting back um, into yeah. yeah, so there's, I don't know, this seems pretty feature complete to me. I mean, this is the site, if I wanted a Star Wars polygons, this definitely is the place. Did, yeah. the, did the code pens that you find, they, did they have the actual Star Wars figures in there? Yeah. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. What would you say was the, well, tell me about the next feature you want to add in here. Cause again, to me, it's well, like, I mean, I just wanted to go more with the, uh, the Star Wars info and the, uh, you know, sh showing off. I wanted to organize this more. I just didn't get around to it enough. Um, more, you know, be able to see your own, um, your stuff. Maybe I, I've got categories involved in, I just get them out yet. So just make it a little more organized, be able to look through it a lot faster, maybe even like a filter button kind of a thing. Got it. Yeah. The the opening screen is that is that CSS? What is how does yeah, that work? HTML and that's it. What is it? CSS and HTML and that's it. Wow. Did yeah. you like did you did you find that on a somewhere? Yeah, so it came with it own its own CSS file. So I kind of had to incorporate that. The biggest, yeah. the biggest, the biggest thing for me was learning CSS in this project. I'll tell you that much, and I learned a lot about it, which is awesome, um, because I was did not know much about it when I started this project. So um, that is my biggest takeaway from this was just how 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 to merge different files with different CSS with with one another. You know? Yeah. Yeah. My mind is a little bit blown about that that enter button <laughs> as part of that. I know exactly. It was just so cool. You know. And if you let it slide away, then you can never enter the site, I guess. I, I, that's why I got the home button up here, you know. <laughs> okay. You can go there if you want. <laughs> this is always here, too, so. Well, Trip, this is really impressive. And uh, when you make it live, let me uh, email it to me, and I'll get my kids on it. For sure. Thanks, man. Okay, congrats. Also, I hope Josh saw it. <laughs> we'll definitely send it to him. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Uh, next up, if you're ready, Dan, if you can go ahead and share your screen and unmute yourself. And the uh, panelist will be Miles. Hello, my name is Dan, and this is my Rugby World Cup app. Uh, I guess Rugby uh, Rugby World Cup 2019. That was the the most uh, previous one. Um, so this is I, I I play rugby, and my desire is rugby. I love it, and I. I I had a hard time deciding what I wanted to do. So I just went with my passion and rugby in America is, is a growing sport. So there's honestly not that many rugby 
based websites. So even uh, just even finding like an API, I figured like ESPN or one of the you know larger uh, uh, sports networks would offer APIs, but they they don't for rugby. So getting that much information was kind of just you know it almost seemed like every just starting developers are building these websites. So I figured you know what why not let's jump in and make one that is uh, easy for the average uh, fan to use. So this is a a user-friendly website. You don't have to log in. The only reason you would have to log in or, re or register is if you wanted to buy a jersey, that which would be a product. So this would be the home page. Uh, let's restart this so we can see the feature. And uh, I use this uh, typewriter um, fonts. I got that from CodePen. And you can scroll down. I got my theme with the tiles from HTML5. You can scroll down all the way through. So every team listed here is a team that participated. There's 20 different countries. Um, from across the from across the world, and the uh, United States is part of it. So you, uh, the user can come on in and they can uh, click on a picture. They can see the team, the world ranking, the name of the country. I embedded YouTube into each team and on the website. That was a challenging part for me. I had to uh, reach out to Peter, but as soon as we did, uh, you know, just one little uh, iframe I had to add to that, and you know, we figured that out. So I was able to add more videos to my uh, my website. Here's the product. Um, to add the product to your cart, you'll have to be logged in. And then uh, I added a footer down here, a picture. This is um, kind of, you know, it's a Japanese theme. The Rugby World Cup was in Japan. So that's everything. Each year, they'll, the logos and everything will be uh, trending around the country. So that's why you'll see some Japanese themed uh, features in here. And uh, to log in, if you're not logged in, you're trying to hop on, it'll just have you log in. And then obviously the teams are the home page. So you can go to the match results. We got the header here again, and you can see every single game here, all the scores. And then here's a cool feature. So this is the Rugby World Cup history. So I used timeline.js on this one, and you can go down and click every single World Cup and see the highlight of it, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, I, I didn't see this feature on any of the websites I went on. You saw timelines, but to have the actual highlights of the videos on there, it didn't give access to it. So it goes all the way dated back. Crazy to see, you know, 1987 uh, Rugby World Cup on here, you know. People playing back then would never have ever even thought of that. And then what the next Rugby World Cup is going to be in, in France. So I have, uh, there's a the typewriter again. It'll be France 2023. Here's a promotional video made by France. Uh, it's all in French as well. And so down here below is, is a list of the host cities. And then there's the shopping cart. So a user can log in. And if the user fails to log in, I added a cat's HTTP on there. So a nice little feature on that. Um, as P Peter would say, I, I uh, did that one on purpose. log in it'll bring you to once you're logged in it'll be in the tab up here you can see some more videos you can see the top tries um i don't know if, is that, if anybody's ever seen the all blacks through the haka uh it's a pretty cool uh warrior dance they do before every single game it's pretty intimidating and then here's also the biggest hits of the tournament so then once you're logged in you pretty much can go in you can go to your team we'll go back to uh to scotland here and then uh you can go down to the cart and you can add it to your shopping cart. And here are all my, uh, my jerseys and products that I uh, have been adding in. And some features I'm, I'm gonna add in, I think, you know, building up for the 2023, I would like to add in maybe a live stream feature to this. And I also would like to add in uh, a little more index on this, a little more uh, data, maybe to be able to see every single game played if you wanted to. I'd probably have a, a larger shopping cart and uh, I think I would tweak up the CSS a little bit. I think that's one thing, uh, probably the biggest thing I needed to work on. Um, as Trip said, I, uh, I learned a lot. Like I, I didn't, I feel like I didn't know that much CSS. I think tying in the CSS that I wanted into the theme was pretty difficult at first. And uh, it took some time, but uh, I'm extremely happy with how this turned out. And this is my app. Yeah, great job, Dan. Thank you so much. Um, it looks like we lost uh, one of our panelists, so uh, we'll be going ahead and uh, 
swapping between Jay and Karen. So Jay, if you can be the panelist for this round, um, and then it'll just rotate between Jay and Karen. Sure, unless my else gets his internet connection back up. Um, really impressive, Dan. This is really cool, and it's great that you followed your passion to build this. So I have a bunch of questions, a lot of features here. For the videos that you have for each team, like th those were like ones that you curated yourself? Um, those, those are just YouTube videos that I um, embedded from YouTube. So they're just World Rugby, or um, I guess the Rugby World Cup and the World Rugby. They mm -hmm. sanction all of rugby, and they're just free videos that they have on YouTube. So I just took the, um, the, the YouTube video ID and I just tied it into each team. Got it. And the scores that you had, that table of scores, is that an image that that's, they provided? Yeah, so I, ideally I wanted to use an API for that, mm -hmm. but I couldn't, I couldn't find one. And I didn't have enough time to make my own tables or to make it look as good. So I figure with a, you know, the time that I have, I'll just add the pitch in there. Sure. So that, yeah. so, uh, version two, I think that'll be, uh, that'll be on there. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Well, it has, it has all the data, so that's good. Um, I'm really curious to dig into the timeline. That seemed really cool. Um, so what exactly is, I mean, I, I see the feature, but how does that work? If you can explain that a little more technically, how what's going on there? So what I did was I went to timeline.js and um, it was basically just a tutorial. It was uh, a lot easier than other tutorials that uh, we probably have done in class. But um, all you had to do is, is tie in, uh, you know, the font or the title that you wanted, a comment on it, and then you had to just copy and paste the YouTube video URL, and it pretty much just posted. So I didn't have to embed this into my app, the, or I guess each individual video through iFrame. I just had to put it into the uh, the Excel sheet and Timeline JS already they they embedded it for me. So they did all the hard work for me. It was if anybody doesn't know. Uh, of Timeline JS, it was a great uh, website to use, and I highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. And if you click on the actual timeline, is that something they let you click on? Like up here? Or yeah, like, yeah, up there. Yeah, so you can click and you can go back. I think um, I would try maybe and in, in use it and see if I can make it look a little bit better. Um, but it just didn't give me the opportunity. But yeah, you can click on up here into yeah. the you know every four years, or you can use the uh, the arrows on either side. And when you yeah. do click on the video, it does uh, it does just play right right in the screen. Yeah, well, it's a really, I mean, I think it looks great in the timeline. It's a really cool feature. Um, what would you say uh, was the, the hardest part of this project? I think at first, uh, the hardest part for me was uh, the theme. And then getting all of my information on the theme, I, um, I think the CSS, adding on other CSS features, um, it kind of, you know, I would add in one feature and it would mess up a CSS feature on another page. So I guess tying that into each part of my uh, my website that was probably the most difficult, and I think you know some of this I, I could clean up, but uh, but I have to have a little bit more time. Got it. No, it look, it, it does look great, and uh, this again really impressive app, and uh, congratulations, Dan. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dan and Jay. Um, so the next presenter is Nate, and the next panelist will be Karen. So Nate, you can go ahead and share your screen. And also unmute yourself. Hey everyone, I'm Nate. Um, I've been a cyclist in Chicago for 13 years, I think now. And over the years, I've wondered, you know, how much pollution am I breathing in? <laughs> like, there's always benefits to biking, um, but I've always wondered, like, are certain routes better for your health in terms of pollution? Um, like. The, does pollution fluctuate during time of day or season, that sort of thing. So I wanted to create a biking app that tried to capture this data. So my app is called Biker. And let's see here. So <clears throat> first thing is you just have this big kind of like epic inspiration image. Uh, it says clean air for every ride. You've got this call to action here. Um, before I do that, I want to explain what it is. So when you go to um, about, it says it's built with array of things. Um, Biker is a Chicago cycling app that provides air quality information for your ride. It uses array of things to keep you up to date on the air you breathe. So I've linked to array of things because we need to understand what that is in order to understand what this app does. Um, rather than read all this stuff, I'll just quickly summarize it. It's basically a network of nodes around the city of Chicago that measure different um, things. So you've got environmental sensors, 
air quality sensors, light and infrared sensors, so on and so forth. Um, and so I thought, why not connect with their API and also tie it into some sort of mapping uh, software? So <clears throat> anyway, we can go back to the home page and click on Get Started. So it takes us over to this map. There's nothing showing up yet. So let's just uh, let's just map the route real quick. So you can see uh, it drew the route and a bunch of stuff just showed up underneath. So you've got this get air quality button and you've also got route information. You've got your origin, destination, and what are called waypoints, which are um, all the coordinates that are required to draw this route. Um, you've got duration and distance as well. Um, so why don't we go ahead and click get air quality. You can see this just popped up right here and it says air quality good and it's got information about the air quality and how it was measured. So it's using this node. This node is located at these coordinates, which this marker is designating on the map. And then you've got PM10 and PM2.5, which are particulate matter uh, measurements. So um, that's it if you don't sign up for an account. Uh, if you do sign up for an account, I've already, I can take you to that page, but rather than fill all this out right now, I've actually got a login I'll use. All right, so once you log in, it kicks you back to the uh, map. But what's stuff has changed in the nav, we've unlocked some secrets. We now have a My Routes button up here. Um, so if we check that out, you can see 14 days ago, I actually saved a route. When you click on more info, you can actually see the air quality uh, measurements for that time. Go back to My Routes and then back to the map. So. Why don't we check out that same route? All right. Sorry about that. It's it's a uh, it saved it had the route in there already, so I just wanted to clear it out real quick. All right, there we go. So as you can see here, are the waypoints for the route, and let's say um, let's say I actually prefer a different route. I can actually change the route up here. Click and drag that. So now you can see the waypoints have changed. So you click get air quality and a new button shows up. It's save route. Um, and that's, <laughs> says our air quality is bad right now. Um, we could save this route if we wanted to. Why don't we tweak it a little bit and see if we can find something that actually has good air quality. I don't wanna spend too much time on it just because maybe the air quality is just bad right now. It still says bad. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. What if we go this way? Get air quality. It looks like we got some bad air quality right now. It's pulling from these different nodes. Um, I'll try one more. Well, that's a funky route. Let's see here. For some reason, now it's good. So it likes it likes that. We can go ahead and save that route. Go back over here, shows up right here. And there's our information for that route. You can go ahead and delete the route if you want. And when you log out, it kicks you back to the home page. Um, <clears throat> real quick, I wanted to demonstrate a longer route. So let's see here. Rogers Park and bike down to Pilsen. I just wanna show you uh, a route that has a lot more nodes along it where we're getting air quality information from. 
So all those markers that just popped up are the air quality nodes that we're getting our information from. And as you can see, oh, we got good air quality. Those are all the nodes, the node coordinates, and then a bunch of observations from those nodes. Um, so yeah, like the whole idea was to basically help people find uh, lower air pollution routes. And uh, for version two, I would love to display this data in a way that's easier to uh, like digest. Um, and then I would love to get this going with like live bike routes, like an actual route that I'm biking, send coordinates up to my app and uh, check out air quality for a ride that I actually just did. So yeah, that's about it. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, Nate. Um, let's open it up to the panelists, Karen. I love this app. It's, uh, I never really think about air quality when I'm on my bicycle. So it's really, it's really interesting. It's definitely cool. very relevant right now. Um, so yeah, I have a few questions about how you actually designed the app. Uh, first of all, what made you choose Mapbox over other mapping platforms? It actually came as a recommendation from Peter. I was gonna use like Google Maps and he was like, no, 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 like <laughs> Maps is way better API and all that kind of stuff. So um, because I had actually never used any mapping software before, um, I yeah, definitely needed some like a recommendation from someone who had. <laughs> so yeah, that's where that came from. Well, no, 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 it's definitely something sounds like you would say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, exactly. <laughs> I don't know if you guys see, saw the t-shirt that I made for, for uh, all of Peter's awesome things. Maybe I'll uh, share it <laughs> sometime after the presentation. But um, yeah, it looks really cool. It definitely looks smoother than Google Maps does. So good job with that. Um, did you run into any difficulties while implementing any of your features? Yeah, definitely. Um, so when it draws the... Uh, it basically creates all the markers for the uh, air quality sensors in the city. There's actually a lot of math that has to be done. Um, Pythagorean theorem was used and uh, to basically, you take all the waypoints from Mapbox, which are all the coordinates for drawing the route, you send them to the back end, and then you've got to basically grab all the nodes in the entire city of Chicago, grab all of their coordinates, find the coordinates that are closest to the coordinates of your route, and then grab the air quality observations from those sensors and display them on the screen. So that there is, this was actually like a, a lot more uh, backend intensive uh, and math intensive process than I had expected when I first started it. That sounds super complicated. <laughs> yeah, it was so, a lot harder than I thought it'd be. <laughs> that's amazing that you got through that. It was such a short amount of time. With the UI, did you build that yourself from scratch or did you use a theme? Um, <laughs> yeah, I used a theme, but then I didn't realize it's not a uh, best practice to basically modify a theme. And I modified a theme <laughs> like crazy. And then Peter uh, check, was checking out my code and he's like, whoa, 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 what'd you do there? <laughs> and I, I basically just chopped apart a theme and made it my own thing so that I could get these pages to actually look how I wanted them to look. Um, so. Yeah, he was just warning me that if they ever update the theme, I might have problems. Uh, oh, wow, yeah. And now I, know, now I know for next time. <laughs> but I did really love how, like, how it turned out because I did customize it so much. Like, I just think it has this, like, really clean layout, but, um, but like, some color to it as opposed to it being, like, really kind of, like, just, like, you know, plain or, or whatever. Like, I, I just like the way that it turned out personally, so. Yeah, it looks seamless. I mean, I... To me, it doesn't look like you had any issues at all with the UI, so. Yeah, he, Peter was saying that, oh, you know, give yourself like three, four hours to install a theme. <laughs> it was like three or four days, honestly, <laughs> just getting it to look like this. I just started obsessing over that side of it. And uh, and I actually am glad I did. I really like how it looks. Yeah, good job with that. People struggle with the theme all the time, so I mean, it, it looks really great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. All right, thank you so much, Neil and Karen. Um, okay, next up, we're going to have uh, Neil and uh, with the panelist, uh, Miles, if you're good to go, we'll, we'll give it a shot. I think I'm good to go, let's give it a shot. <laughs> I'm, on, All right. I'm on my dad's lumbering 2009 Dell PC right now, so, <laughs> but it does have an ethernet connection, which is important. 
that, that'll do the trick. Um, I saw Howard W join the chat and I'm like, oh man, I, I'm getting zoom bombed over here. But I think, I think it's miles. I saw the W I'm like, all right, I'm gonna take a chance on it. I was gonna, I was gonna ban you forever. Um, cool, cool, cool. So, uh, other panelists stand by Jay in case, uh, miles. So don't stress it. If your internet connection sort of wonks out, uh, Jay will be the panelist for that. Um, but we'll give it a shot. Um, so up, Nate, up next, we're going to have, uh, Neil. Um, so Neil, if you can go ahead and unmute and uh, share your screen. Uh, hey, my name is Neil, um, and this is my app. Uh, so for the idea for my app, it was actually, I kind of had an idea before I came into the actual cohort. Um, I work as a shipper for a uh, art restoration and uh, facility, and there we actually sell uh, Audubon prints. Uh, and uh, I don't know if, if people know who Audubon is, but he is an old time uh, ornithological uh, printmaker. Uh, he uh, is very well known within the art community as well as um, scientific community uh, for his work. Uh, but uh, yeah, so what I did is I tried to make a replica of an online version of my current place of employment. Um, so for here is the main page uh, that takes it from the home uh, where it shows a lot more about the uh, just information about prints and our mission statement uh, for our gallery. But from here we can uh, sign up. And from here we can log into email, password, first name, phone number, address, uh, and that'll be your information for your shipping address. Uh, so when you actually do purchase your prints, uh, you can be shipped to your addresses there. Uh, but for sake of time, we'll just log into a pre-made account. Uh, so after logging in, it takes you back to the main page. Uh, and from here, uh, we can check out the about page, which just gives a little bit more information about uh, the work that we do uh, and the quality that we try to strive for, uh, as well as just giving a little bit more information about what we products we sell. Uh, and from here, uh, we can go check out the uh, various types of products he has. Uh, so John James Audubon made over 400 uh, prints of the birds of America. Uh, I have about 13 on here uh, to display. Uh, so we can click on any of these uh, birds. So if I want to buy uh, this purple grackle, uh, I can click on the more information from here and it takes it to a uh, page that shows the full plate page, uh, as well as the plate number, the medium at which it's printed in, uh, the price, the number of prints uh, left in this edition, as well as just a small description about the uh, bird itself. And from here, we can add it to our cart or uh, click to go back to our plates to search for something else. Uh, and one feature that we tried to implement here is a, a sale map. So the idea behind this is that uh, basically uh, where you live, uh, if you live in a certain area and you type in a species, so I'm gonna try uh, searching for my favorite bird, which is the tufted titmouse. And it brings back a, uh, <clears throat> a map with the uh, living range within uh, the, where the tufted titmouse lives. And so the idea behind this is that if, uh, where your zip code is, if uh, you live within the area that has, uh, where the tufted titmouse lives, uh, you can get a discount on the print uh, if the bird is local or native to the area. Uh, so let's say if you live in Washington or Oregon, uh, you'd have to pay a full price for uh, the print, but uh, you would be able to get prints or discounts on other prints that are uh, available there. Uh, and from here, I kind of just added this uh, neat little feature, uh, some live cameras uh, of birds of prey. Uh, so here is an embedded video of uh, the some red tail hawks. And so this is a live streamed video uh, of a nesting feature. And so let's say I watched this for hours and I'm just like, I really love this bird. Uh, so you can click here to go to more info and I'll take you to its uh, direct plate page. 
so this is the red tail talk uh, red tail talk page for uh, the plate. Uh, and from here, we can go to our shopping cart, which lists all their prints that we can uh, are in our shopping cart. And from here, we can either go back to all plates or check out. Uh, and uh, after we've checked out, and we can log out, and it'll take us back to our main page. And that's about it. All right, great job, Neil. Um, let's give it up to Miles or Howard, however, however you want to go by. Um, to open up for questions. Cool, Neil. That was that's awesome. And this is actually super crazy. I just watched this movie like a week ago called, uh, I think it's called American Animals, and it's about some yeah. college students who who steal an Audubon uh, book from or attempt to steal it from from a university library. Yeah, um, I can tell you right now that those books are very very heavy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I'm curious. Um, I don't know if you want to just talk through maybe the tech stack a little bit. Um, I'm assuming this front end visual aspect is uh, using Bootstrap of some sort, but maybe if you just want to delve a little bit more into the tech. Uh, yeah, I mean, it just used uh, Bootstrap, uh, Ruby on Rails, and uh, Vue.js mainly for this. Um, I guess when it comes to what I struggled with mostly, it was probably just the theme. I had some uh, issues with uh, my theme not working with my CSS, uh, for example, these like sign up pages, they're supposed to be a separate box around here that uh, for some reason doesn't allow me to access our forms when it's around it. And also uh, the sales map uh, feature, I uh, for some reason had a big problem uh, just returning my own theme uh, when I tried to load that up. So, um, but Peter helped me out with that. Cool. And then if there's anything you would, with more time, maybe um, consider adding or any any things maybe you wanted to do that you didn't get around to doing. Uh, yeah, I mean, just overall quality of life, uh, like updates. Uh, you know, like I said, there are 400 different uh, prints to choose from. I have 13, but obviously searching through each one would be hard. So having like a search feature or an alphabet or some type of sorting category, uh, maybe by name and uh, alphabet or uh, region would be nice. Uh, so there's always things you can work on. And then as you were building this, was there any idea or tech or, or feature that you came across that um, you know you found really interesting and are considering kind of exploring going forward or? Well, I'd like to ideally uh, explore more around with this like bird uh, <clears throat> habitat region area. Uh, it's a pretty cool feature. Uh, right now, this is just an actually iframe link within a separate website. Uh, but actually, maybe like search around and find an actual API uh, that has this information that I can use uh, would be ideal. Yeah, I was going to say this is really cool, but I think it would be, you know, even better to if, if this eBird site had some some public APIs that you could then get the data from and, and sort of yeah, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of uh, public APIs about bird habitat ranges. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like an unexplored market. Maybe that's uh, yeah. <laughs> um, cool. Yeah, it's, this is an awesome, awesome job. Really like it. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much, Miles and Neil. Um, our next presenter is going to be uh, Liam, and I'm sort of trying to figure out the order of panelists. I'm assuming it would be Karen who will be the panelist for uh, for Neil, if that makes sense. Um, and so we have Liam and then Dan Claire as the last two presenters. Liam, you can go ahead and unmute and share your screen. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. How's it going, everybody? My name is Liam. Um, and my app was an idea that I had um, from basically me and my semester um it was like our number one big thing to go around and just ask people um and kind of get recommendation ideas out of them and so i was thinking um why not make like a a, a nuanced social media type app um where instead of posting tweets or pictures you post recommendations for different kinds and an Instagram poll. And it turns out that 
5% of my followers, which chose to answer the music or ideas they, they get from recommendation from people in the past. So I figured, um, or like close friends and family. So I figured why not just kind of automate the process um, of sending recommendations to and receiving recommendations from your friends, why not automate that process um, in a social media app? Um, so if I wanted to create a new recommendation, it would, it would first tell me that I need to log in, um, but that doesn't mean that I can't view recommendations while um, without making an account. So I have this genres bar, um, which in version 2.0 will link to specifically um, movie recommendations, book recommendations, um, TV, it, it, basically these will all link recommendations page, edit, delete, um, or create recommendations as I like to call them. Um, and there's also this static who to follow bar that um, actually my high school room machine learning algorithm to be able to um, plug in my back end and determine uh, which already initialized users uh, are A, in a close proximity to well, uh, their optimal users from that machine learning app will be plugged into this who to follow bar. Um, so, Let's say I want to sign up. I'll create Peter. I'll create you. Um, your own account. Um, it's the password. That's the password. Um, and so now you. Um, if it's not. Uh, you see a profile page pop up um, in version 2.0. You'll be able to navigate to your profile page. Um, and you might also notice uh, that Peter has a lot of clout already. Those are uh, basically, uh, well, those are static variables. The only variable here in the profile um, page that isn't static is the uh, rec recommendations uh, variable, which if I were to create recommend uh, for a, uh, Peter told me he likes the movie Layer Cake, so I'll make that a recommendation for him. So now you'll see his recommendation recommendations has changed um, to one. Um, one of the I'll just go out and, and also a uh, feature now. Obviously, you can see these uh, font awesome icons um, to uh, basically edit the recommendations that you create. Um, I used a Gravatar Ruby gem. Um, to create these user icons. This is the um, default template for Gravatar. Um, and obviously when, when somebody will be able to view their profile page, they'll also have the option um, to upload a video or upload a, uh, an image file in the form of uh, either JPEG or PNG and uh, be able to um, create their own uh, profile picture. So um, now Peter can view all of um, the recommendations that have been made. Uh, obviously, I need a uh, I need a relationships model. That was by far and large the uh, the hardest part of this app was getting or trying to configure um, a relationships uh, model with both a follower ID and a followed ID um, to basically keep track of the follow each users, how many people they're following, um, and who's following them, uh, and all. I have, once I have that come to the recommendations in the user's feed of the individuals uh, follow or the people that they're following. Um, but until I can get that model set up, I have to, um, I basically just have to deal with the fact that uh, every recommendation that gets created um, can be viewed by an individual. Uh, that it won't be too much of a problem until uh, the app gets larger and there's more recommendations being made and you're just seeing all of these strangers um, that might not even speak the same language as you, all of their recommendations, which 
uh, is why I need uh, in this in these next couple weeks uh, to uh, configure that relationships model. Um, what else? Uh, this is right now. Um, this this capstone presentation uh, was a really good benchmark. Um, but I'm currently working on uh, looking at iOS SDKs and uh, trying to make this into an actual mobile app because uh, my vision for this is more um, is more something that users would use on a cellular device. Um, although I, I'll probably make touches to the website. Um, when I see fit, but uh, pending a relationships model and a genres model, um, the genres model will have, uh, I forget what the, uh, it will have movies, books, TV shows, music, art, restaurants. Um, you'll be able to, upon the creation of a recommendation, um, there'll be an options bar that'll drop down and basically ask what type of recommendation are you making? Um, and it will send your recommendation both uh, to the feeds of all of the people that are following you and also um, to the feed for each specific genre. Um, so there's still a few more steps that need to be taken, um, but I'm, I'm very, very happy with my, with my progress thus far. All righty, thank you so much, Liam. Um, so the connection uh, for your, your presentation is a little bit choppy, so there might have been sections that uh, uh, Karen, as a panelist, you might not have heard as clearly. Um, but one question I did want to ask before Karen, I'll open it up to more questions, is uh, the uh, technologies that you chose in terms of front end and back end. Uh, could you talk about that in some of the libraries you use? Because you might not be able to see it here, but you probably made a lot of choices that strayed from the curriculum that we taught um, in the bootcamp yeah. itself. Yeah. Um, so to handle the user models, um, I basically, I did not use Vue.js. Um, I used a Ruby gem called Bulma, um, which is a way of handling like simple, and also a Ruby gem called simple form, um, which it, it's basically just a form, it, it's a way, um, you'll notice I'm not in localhost 8080, I'm in localhost 3000. So this is actually technically all running from the back end. Um, and it was just a matter of editing the um, ed, uh, the like edit.html.erb and the new.html.erb, creating a feeds.html.erb um, that has both like uh, all of them. And there's a profile file, and those all just display each of these unique components. Um, I used, uh, I used devise to handle the user models. Um, and uh, I used, um, there was a, in simple form, they have like a uh, simple social um, layout that you can use to kind of just create like a, um, a like a, a very simplistic um, social media interface. Um, and I used a lot of that syntax as well. Um, but that was, that was, pr that's pretty much the extent of all of the, um, it was, it was all done through, uh, one Ruby on Rails, um, project and server. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah. So Karen, if you wanted to open it up for other questions, I just wanted to make sure you had that context because I believe when you were, went through the program, we were like doing a, a full stack approach. Um, and currently, um, in this bootcamp, for those of you who are, may not be aware, like we teach, you know, a separated backend and front end. So you'll see most of the projects where the backend is Ruby on Rails, the front end is Vue.js, but Liam took a very different route. And so he had to teach himself a lot of those different techniques. Um, so Karen, if you have other questions. Yeah, thanks for uh, uh, having him talk about that. That um, helps me with my question, questions as well. Um, yeah, so what made you decide to go with the route that you did instead of the, I guess, more curriculum and traditional approach? Um, it, was, it was a combination of, uh, I did not find a lot of, um, I guess, Vue.js, uh, I don't know what the word I'm looking for here is. Uh, I, I guess the, when I, when I looked up like uh, social media front end techniques, um, the majority of the successful companies that I found 
um, and like interfaces that I saw. Uh, when I inspected them, they were pretty much all doing the same thing, um, configuring uh, usually on just like the back end, like Twitter is a, a good example. Um, Twitter does not use Ruby on Rails, but they run the entirety of their user interface um, using strictly back end. Um, and I think it's I think it kind of just automates a very difficult um, user model that has all sorts of relationship attributes. Um, but I I've, I tried initially with Vue.js and neither the formatting that I was able to get um, nor the uh, nor the interface, the simplistic. I, I wasn't I wasn't quite able to get. Uh, a, a, as clean of an interface as I was when I watched a few tutorial videos on Bulma and saw how how fast and and easy and easy they were able to create um, really really clean uh, displays. Gotcha. So you discovered that like pretty early on in the in your process, right before you actually started working on it. Yeah. Cool. So what feature did you enjoy building the most? Um, I really, I really like the, the user model when I was finally able to configure, um, the username, uh, to, and the, uh, the name of the individual to display right above the rec of that took probably, that took me probably three days in and of itself. Um, and I, I kept getting all of these ridiculous errors. Um, and all it took was just, it was literally just one div tag. Uh, that was out of place after like hours of looking for it um, that I finally was able to make uh, the feed dot html dot erb file display the way that I wanted it to and the final finishing touch on that was getting the name and username of the individual um, user and also um, a very small feature um, but one that also took me a lot of time uh, to configure was the ability to only be able to um, edit, create, or share a recommendation if it was your own. Notice that I'm not signed in and I don't have uh, any of the um, icons that would allow me to delete or edit um, or share my recommendation. Um, the being able to integrate that, it was a very small feature, um, but one that was uh, I think I actually probably took the most away from in terms of uh, ideas to use in the future. Um, so after that was after that was configured, I was I was really really happy with myself. That's awesome. Yeah, sometimes it's just that you know, like you said earlier, that one issue that you had when you finally figured it out. I'm sure it felt awesome. So um, curiosity sake, the icons or the avatars next to the names, are those able to be changed to profile pictures? Yeah, they are. Um, the, the problem is that since I, um, since I haven't created the profile, um, the edit profile page yet, um, right now it's configured so that if I made, if I changed the Gravatar image, it would change them for all of the accounts that I created it on. Um, so that's why I didn't like set my icon to my own face because then Peters would have my face and Asher's would have my face and Jim would have my face. So I, I basically just set it to the, to the default Gravatar image. And then, um, but it, to answer your question, yes, um, eventually, eventually you'll, you will be able to change um, it for only your account. Right. So it looks like with some of the features that it's, it's easier to do it using the, um, the technology that you use, but some other things may be more complicated. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I was, by this point, um, the Gravatar, um, this was only uh, three or four days ago. So I was kind of already very committed and uh, just finding out that, you know, where there are some strengths with using uh, the, the route that I went, there are uh, just as many weaknesses. Um, and this was, this was a, a key point where I was like, man, I definitely don't have enough time to uh, build a Vue.js front end and, um, and make it look as nice and pretty as what I already have. Um, but 
I, I know that it, it can happen. It'll just take, it'll just take a lot more work and configuration. Um, but that's, uh, I'm not like, this is, this is an ongoing, um, project for me, um, to, to continue working on. So, so I, I'm, I'm confident. That. That you had. So like, great yeah. job. Like, it was, it, Thank you. Very com complex behind the scenes for sure. And you did an awesome job with it. You said it's called Thank Bulma, B-O-L-M-A. B-U-L-M-A, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Liam and Karen. Okay, so we have uh, one more panelist for this session. Uh, I'm sorry, one more presenter for this session, and that's Dan Clare, and the panelist will be Jay Wengro. So Dan, if you can go ahead and uh, share your screen. Hello, everybody. My name is Dan, and uh, I've always been one who's been uh, very interested in new technologies, uh, more recently, especially green technologies, technology that's good for the environment. And for me, there's no cooler green technology than electric cars right now. Um, they're only gonna get more popular as the world moves away from fossil fuels. And so I, figure, you know, what's the biggest barrier to that is for most people is they've never ridden in one, maybe never driven one. They're not familiar with this whole new paradigm of how to um, fuel your car when you're not going to a gas station. Um, I know that if it was me wanting to buy uh, an electric car, I would want to, you know, connect with someone who has one already. So I could talk with them, meet up, maybe get together, ride in it, drive it maybe. Uh, and that is where my app comes in. It is called Electrify Me. It's a social app for uh, electric car owners, electric car enthusiasts, electric car curious, if you will, uh, to connect with each other, uh, talk about electric cars, have meetup events. We can all kind of get together uh, and take a look. So jumping right in, we can sign up if we don't have an account, but I signed up for this on day one, very into this. So let me just sign in with the credentials I already made. And the first thing you're taken to is an events page. So this is a list of all of the events that are coming up. Um, you know, gives some info about where it is, when it is, and you can kind of see what's going on all around. And it looks like, oh, it looks like there's one happening in Pittsburgh. I'm from there, maybe I should check that event out. So if I go to show event, takes me to the event page where I can see uh, a little more info about what's happening, when it's happening. It looks like it's happening sometime in late June, June 20th. And it actually maps on this uh, Mapbox integration. It maps directly to that already. It's already pre-populated. So, you know, I might check this out because my family's from Pittsburgh. So I could kill two birds with one stone, go visit some family. So. I want to see if it's worth it. Seven hour, 26 minutes. Why not? I'll make a weekend of it. That sounds good. Uh, I can see exactly how long it'll take me to get there. I think I do want to go to this event. So let me see. I'm going to let the event creator know. Yeah, I'll be there. So I can submit a comment and that shows up there. You can also see who's attending these events. So it shows their name and shows the car that they're gonna be driving. So if I really wanna know more about the Nissan Leaf, I can, go, I can go there knowing that Twyla's gonna be there with her Nissan Leaf. So I, I know that I can see something that I've never seen before. So I'm gonna say that I'm gonna attend that event and click that there. And once I do that, my name shows up and my future car <laughs> shows up there. Not quite yet, uh, we'll get there. But yeah, so that shows up there and that's great. But what if I wanna make sure that I'm not over committing myself? Well, I can actually go up to the menu here and go back to my home base. This would be the equivalent of a profile page. And actually in version two of the app, this would be a profile page. Everyone would be able to have one of these and input the car that they have um, or maybe the car that they want and stuff like that. Uh, 
differentiate whether it's actually yours or not, whether it's going to be at an event or not. But you can have that there, and uh, then it shows all the events that you have RSVP'd to. So it looks like I'm going to be a little busy uh, coming up here. You know what? Uh, that Pittsburgh event is showing up. That's great. But this Saturday meetup, that's a couple of days from now, it's happening in a Costco parking lot. I must have signed up for that first thing right whenever I signed up for this service. Costco parking lot, I don't think I actually want to be in one of those right now. Uh, so I think I'm going to go ahead and say, no, I'm not going to attend this event. So yeah. So as soon as I do that, I'm no longer in that list. If I go back to my home base, that event is no longer in there. Now that's all great and everything, but if I don't want to deal with just like scrolling through an endless list of events, uh, I can actually see what events are near me. I can either get there from this button right here, events near me, or there's this link that's always available in the menu. And this actually took a while to implement uh, and figure out how to get Mapbox to map all these events. These are all the events that are currently coming up. So if I want to take a look, I'm in Chicago. I'm going to Pittsburgh. There's that event I'm going to on the 20th of June. I can actually say, oh, well, there's one in Cleveland. That's not too far out of the way. So I can click on that. And it's actually happening the next day. That's great. So I can go to that events page. And, you know, nothing against Cleveland, but I'm not sure if I want to go there. So let's see if there's any cars that are going to be there that are maybe, uh, you know, would make the trip worthwhile. So looks like, holy crap, this guy's going to bring a Tesla Cybertruck. That thing. <laughs> Thing's not even out yet. I, I want to go see that thing. Oh, this guy says he's actually going to let anyone test drive it. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to make the trip to that event to see this car from the future, uh, most definitely. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tell him. I'm gonna tell Roland how much I want to go see his car. I want to drive his car. I want to drive it very badly. So now that shows up there shows that I'm going to be there. I will drive this around. I will do donuts. I will peel out. It'll be great. So I'm back at home base real quick. Now that I'm looking at this, I think there's actually a lot of events on here coming up. I should maybe, uh, I should maybe, you know, not go to all of these. Uh, I have a lot coming up, but a lot of driving to do, but it should be a good time. So that is my app. That is Electrify Me. All right, thank you so much, Dan. Uh, open it up to questions with uh, Jay. Yeah, this is a fantastic app, Dan. Um, tell me if I'm wrong, but it seems like there's a lot of complex database association stuff here because you've got events that have cars and then comments. Am I right about that? Yes, that was probably <laughs> the most common thing that I was asking for help from from Peter from one of the TAs uh, was just how to wrangle the data that I already put in here myself. Um, lots of join tables, uh, lots of relationships between the, the two things. So actually, you know, if you, if you say that you're going to an event, um, there's an events table, there's a users table, um, and then there's what I called an event users table. So if you say that you're going to attend an event that actually creates a new event user. And so it links together the user to the event and says, you know, I'm using that to show that you're actually attending it. Um, and then you have access to like what car they're going to have there. Uh, and eventually I would build out the ability to, you know, if someone has more than one car um, on their profile, they'd be able to say like, you know, this is the car I'm bringing whenever, whenever they actually attend the event. So yeah, there's kind of complex data that lots and lots of tables. <laughs> and I, uh, that's actually something I learned a lot from is like how better to make sure I'm planning out my data. Um, I think I did a, a thorough job of it, but just keeping track of the complexity of that, it was, it was a pretty big challenge actually. Yeah, got it. Um, tell me more about the map feature. I guess, tell me more yeah. about the challenge that you went through and how you overcame that. Yeah, um, so cool feature. yeah, I, I actually getting it to work on an event page itself 
um, I think turned out to be harder overall, um, especially getting, you know, the, the theme that I ended up going with, the HTML theme that I ended up going with, or CSS theme, uh, broke a lot of the controls mm. whenever I integrated this uh, Mapbox API. So it was a lot of trial and error and like trying to figure out which classes went with what and, um, you know, actually getting uh, the location, like, I, you know, you notice I didn't have to put like an address here. Whenever mm -hmm. you create that event, you can just say like Golden Gate Bridge, Space Needle, whatever it is. And there's a geocoder um, integrated with this map as well. So that when you are creating that event, um, you can just type something like that and it will find it that way. It's similar to like when you're typing here and you can just start typing Chicago or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. um, so that was probably the hardest part about it. Um, I definitely needed some help figuring out how to get uh, the location pre-populated in there. Um, mm -hmm. The thing that surprised me most is uh, doing the events near me. Um, after doing all that work on the event page, it was shockingly easy to get all of these to map through with like a v4 on all the mm -hmm. events uh, and their locations i basically like started working on this events near me page and tweaked it a bit and like finally got the map to show up and changed like one div and, and refresh and all of a sudden they all showed up <laughs> and it was like a huge relief uh to just have it kind of work quote unquote for free in that way it must have been a good moment yeah um yeah this is uh amazing what would be the very next feature that you would add uh next feature that i would add probably would be like i said the ability to actually designate what your car is uh, and make make the home base more of a profile page so that people could interact that way like with direct messaging as well um kind of say hey are you are you really going to be here with this car? I want to be there and see that thing, you know, carry on conversations. Um, I would say after that would be maybe specializing some more, um, you know, there are owners clubs for various types of cars, like, you know, the ability to have groups that you could also implement on here as well would be uh, another aspect to that. Got it. Well done. This is a, like I said, a fantastic app. Uh, really well done. Congrats. Thank you. All righty, everybody. So that was actually our uh, last presenter. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop that screen share. Uh, I did want to say, uh, you know, I, I was a little bit, it's a little bit, uh, I don't know if ironic is the right word, that uh, Jay was the panelist for both Dan and Trip and some other people where Jay's going to miss all of those little subtle references, like uh, Dan had uh, Shit's Creek characters in there, and it's like Jay's going to miss all those pop culture references, so... So it's just a little unfortunate, but you know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, your, your questions were still valid, Jay, but you know. Uh, it'd be <laughs> yes, I, missed, I missed all the references, I guess. <laughs> like, you know, uh, I think actually Jay might've recognized some of the Star Wars references, but you know, you got a BB-8 rolling around and Jay's just staring at this weird circle. He's like, okay, I don't, I don't know what that's supposed I to mean. I know, I know. What <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, so we're gonna go ahead and wrap this up. I just wanted to say, you know, uh, you know, big, uh, you know, uh, appreciation and uh, sort of, uh, I just wanted to thank all of the, the student presenters who, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you guys had a, a very sort of uh, difficult situation to, to transition, um, you know, uh, into a global pandemic in the middle of your cohort. And you guys just did an amazing job. And I know, you know, the timing of that sort of chopped, you know, your flow uh, in terms of getting, working on your capstones and sort of getting that momentum and any developer knows that's, that's a very difficult thing to sort of have a lot of starts and stops into your system. Um, and you guys just really pulled through uh, and did an amazing job. Um, and to see such a diverse set of applications with, uh, you know, such high quality is, is really nice to see. Um, so yeah, I also wanted to thank, you know, the panelists, uh, Karen, uh, Miles and, and Jay for coming in and uh, talking uh, through the project with the students. Um, you know, and also everybody who was involved helping the students, uh, this cohort, uh, teaching assistants, uh, as well as Lisa, our career counselor, who's going to be working with you all uh, in the in the in the days to come. Um, so we're not just we're not done yet, um, but uh, you guys have a lot to be proud of, and I know you worked super hard. So you know, just congratulations to everybody. 
Um, and we're going to go ahead and conclude this particular live stream, but we have another live stream starting up at 730 where we'll see um, the rest of the uh, students from this particular cohort. So I just want to clap um, for everyone that went. Good job, everyone. This was, this was great. Great yeah, job. You guys did a great job. I'll deserve a round of applause. All right. I'm going to go ahead and conclude this live stream. And uh, for those of you who want to watch, I'll see you all at 730.